Peace and love. This is Penelope. Back with episode one, part three. We're going to dive deep a little bit into William Penn describes the Lenny Lenape Indians of Pennsylvania. So what I'm going to do is just read uh, section by section and, you know, find out what some of these references mean, some of these words. So first, he says, the natives I shall consider in their persons, language, manners, religion, and government with my sense of the original. For their persons, they are generally tall, straight, well-built, and of singular proportion. They tread strong and clever and mostly walk with a lofty chin of complexion, black, but by design as the gypsies in England. So he says, they're black of complexion, but by design as the gypsies in England. Get to that in a second. He says, they grease themselves with black, with bear's fat, clarified, and using no defense against the sun or weather, their skins must needs be swarthy. What does swarthy mean? Let's see. All right, the definition of swarthy. Swarthy is an objective that means dark in color, complexion, or cast. It can also refer to dark pigmentation of the hair, skin, or eyes. For example, you might describe someone's complexion as swarthy. If it is if it's weather beaten and darkened by the sun, or if they have an olive complexion. Uh, synonyms of swarthy swarthy include black, brunette, brunette, dark, swart, dusky, and dark skinned. The word swarthy was first used in 1587 and is an alteration of the obsolete word swarty, swarty. All right, all right. Also, what does swarthy lady mean? Okay. Of a person's complexion or skin color or of a person, dark in color or tone, black or blackish. All right. So, swarthy means black, color. Uh, okay, so the Lenny Lenape were black. All right? He also says, uh, back to that gypsy thing, he says, of complexion black, but by design as the gypsies in England. Now, I have a little something on that. Gypsies in England. And this is actually I'll give I'll I'll give you the name of the book. Uh but it's uh from from an old book. And it says, the Scots of ancient Scotia, now Ireland, having spread themselves over the greater part of that province of our country, which has become known by their name. And the earlier Maury of Scotland, having, having been seated in that, territory, in that territory for a longer period than their swarthy comrades of the southwest and later and a latter and a later flood of nigri gents n i g r a e nigri gents dub gals or black foreigners having invaded and ruled over a large portion of Northern and Western Scotland. It is clear that the inhabitants of the various districts of North Britain 
ought to show their connection with the still existent Tory clans of our country, generally whom we conventionally style gypsies. As these, as we have seen, were till quite le recently pits, picks, and to some extent they are still Moors, like their forefathers. Therefore, we need not and indeed cannot distinguish between an early Scot and an early Pick, since although somewhat different in manners, they resembled each other closely enough in complexion and temperament. So we're talking about people in Britain, in England, which we as black people in America, you know, most of us who are, you know, considered African Americans or, you know, whatever that is, uh, we don't, cons we don't think of people coming from England or, you know, originating from England as having, you know, black complexion. But here in this situation, William Penn is describing the Lenny Lenape of Pennsylvania. And he's saying that they're black, but they look like people he saw in England, the gypsies. All right, interesting, very interesting. All right, let's go to another section. He talks about their houses being mats and or barks of trees, not higher than one story, or not higher than a man, actually, is what he says. Um, very small, not a whole lot of, you know, elaborate residences and things like that. They lived very simply and, you know, off the land. Less is more is how they lived. All right, um, he says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back up to that first paragraph. Um, he says, their eye is little and black, not unlike a straighty look at Jew. So I could not find anything about a straighty look at Jew. But I'm assuming that he was talking about Jews or Israelites in his country, in Britain, in Ireland. Because uh, obviously they were there. Uh, okay, he says, the thick lip, lip and flat nose so frequent with the East Indians, East Indians, and blacks are not common for them. For I have seen as calmly European-like faces among them of both, as on your side the sea, and truly the Italian complexion hath not much the white, and the noses of several of them have much of the Roman. So he is saying that the Lenny Lenape were a very, very tall race of people generally. They were black with what he considered European features but not black European. I mean, I'm sorry, not white European, per se. Black, swarthy Europeans. So, um, I find that very interesting. Don't know what quite to make of it yet, but um, very interesting. 
Moving on. He says, in liberty they excel. Nothing is good for nothing is too good for their friend. Give them a fine gun, coat, or other thing, and it may pass twenty hands before it sticks. Light of heart, strong of strong affections, but soon spent. The most merry creatures that live, feast, and dance perpetually. They never have much nor want much. Wealth circulateth like blood. All parts partake. I really, really, really like, uh, you know, the way that he articulated that. He said, wealth circulateth like blood. In other words, their wealth is like, was like blood. Everybody had abundance in their mind. There was no such thing as poverty. And everybody had their, you know, what they needed. Nobody had to take anything from anybody. Nobody had to rob anybody because there was no poverty. So he says, they care little because they want but little. And the reason is a little contents them. In this, they are sufficiently revenged on us. If they are ignorant of our pleasures, in this, he says, if they are ignorant of our pleasures, they are also free from our pains. So that's basically what I just said. Um, they, you know, their their ways for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years was not like the ways of these newcomers on the land. Okay. He talks about, you know, how uh, once the European came here, uh, they became, you know, hooked on alcohol, which we know is still uh, a problem today. We as descendants of these people and mixed blood with those that came here, you know, we still suffer from these issues in terms of, you know, addiction. All right. All right. This, this was very interesting. He says, he was talking about um, the ceremonies that they have and the way that they dance. And I had hoped to bring up something, to have something to show. But the way that he describes it, he says, uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> All right. The cantica, all right. The other part of their, the other part is their cantica or or dance performed by round dances, sometimes words, sometimes songs, then shouts. Two being in the middle that begin, and by singing and drumming on a board direct the chorus. Their postures in the dance are very antic and differing, but all keep measure. So what it kind of reminded me of is like, you know, how we be, you know, when, when, when we dancing and everybody is, you know, like we, everybody is in time, but we're not doing exactly the same dance, like, like line dancing. Line dancing is different from, uh, just, you know, 
dancing, you're dancing to the music and somebody else is dancing to the music too. But they're in time, but they're not doing what you're doing. So I thought that that was very interesting, you know, uh, interesting observation about, uh, you know, their swagger. <laughs> he, he spoke about that too, you know, when he was talking about how they walked. Right? Um, i go to... Two pages? All right, where is that? Okay. I'm missing a page. All right, I'm going to pause this real quick. I found it. So he says in in the last part, he's talking about the um, arrangements and agreements that were made between his colony and uh, the, the, the folks that were there when he was actually there with the Lenape Indians. And it was his intention to you know, lay down some guidelines in terms of, you know, how they were dealt with respectfully um, and fairly, right? Um, so he says, we have agreed that in all differences between us, six of each shall, six of each side shall end the matter. Don't abuse them, but let them have justice and you win them. The worst is that they are worse for the Christians who have propagated their vices and yielded them tradition for ill and not for good things. But even as low, I put in that even, but as low as an ebb as they are at and as glorious their condition looks, the Christians have not outlived their sight with all their pretensions to a higher manifestation. And this part. What good then might not a good people graft where there is so distinct a knowledge left between good and evil? I beseech God to incline the hearts of all that come into these parts to outlive the knowledge of the natives but a fixed obedience to their greater knowledge of the will of God, for it were miserable indeed for us to fall under the just censure of the poor Indian conscience while we, we make profession of things so far transcending. So what did he mean by that? Why, why was that a big deal to him? Why did he feel like they were, you know, being hypocritical. So, Penn was a Quaker and living the, their true conscience or their will was a, you know, was a big deal. I don't know about the Quakers now, but these guys went to jail. Okay. They stood up against the crown they fought against injustices and, you know, their people and comrades and family uh, having their uh, goods and land seized, uh, people being, their people being transported out of England, out of all of these parts in Britain, in England and uh, Scotland, Ireland. Uh, they were... They were uh, uh, cleansed out of these places, the darker races, the swarthy English. Uh, so Penn was a, you know, he was, he was a Quaker. And as I said, you know, it, he was serious about it. He went to jail, him and his, you know, the, the, his comrades. 
So I'm going to read something now from this book. It's called William Penn's Holy Experiment. And this is what he had hoped that, you know, would happen. This is, you know, what this book is about. What he wanted to happen here uh, with his colony that he planted. This is about uh, George Fox. And some of these names, you know, as I read these books, you know, our streets are named for these people. It's amazing. All right. So this is about George Fox, one of his friends. And uh, it's it, this is about his seventh imprisonment. And, he's, and he talks about the tender conscience. I, I hope to elaborate on that so you can understand what he meant by that when he was referring to the Lenny Lenape. So Fox's seventh imprisonment, his third during the Restoration era, era was the longest he would ever suffer. It began in early January 1664 when upon returning to Swarthmore after completing his third national mission Telling you these guys were serious. They were not, you know. Okay. He learned soldiers had been searching for him. He set off to the home of their colonel five miles away to inquire about the search. Although he was assured there was nothing against him, the colonel warned Fox that Margaret Fell could not keep great meetings at her house for they met contrary to the act, presuming, presum, presumably a reference to the Quaker Act of 1662. Later arrested upon a warrant, Fox was examined by the justices of the peace, ensnared on his principled refusal to take any oaths, and dismissed subject to his engagement to appear at the Lancaster sessions, which he did on January 12th. Before the sessions, Judge Justices Fox eloquently defended the Quaker principles holding of holding truth and loving all people and of being neither a terror to the king's subjects nor an enemy to any, as premised in the act's introduction and implied in the justice's questions. Upon being asked to take the oath of allegiance in his, his in, in upon being asked to take the oath of allegiance, his response that Quaker allegiance did not lie in oaths but in truth and faithfulness made inevitable his commitment to prison to await the seasons to await the assizes. On March 14th and 16th, assize judge Thomas Twisden heard Fox's defense regarding the oath that in, that in obedience to Christ, he did not swear. That he was a man of tender conscience and that he had both the king's word and his declaration at Breda, promising protection to those of tender conscience. He was found guilty and denied the verdict, which required his being remanded to jail to await next assizes. In the meantime, Fox directed friends to inscribe an account of their sufferings and put them before the sessions, justices. For friends has suffered deeply by fines and distresses, the bailiffs and officers making great havoc and spoil of their goods, but no redress was made. So, you know, what was happening during these times is the same thing that happened here once they started coming here, and this is kind of uh 
happening simultaneously. Uh, the Quakers or the English and you know Penn was a part of a prominent family that worked for the crown and also uh, he was also opposed to the ways of the crown. Uh, so as a result, you know, he, he went to jail a lot. And what I would, what I'm going to do is I'd like to read this book uh, in my next installments, I'm going to just read the book. Okay. Uh, it will bring a lot of clarity and understanding about how, what happened and the things that were happening between, uh, you know, the English crown and Great Britain and who all of these players were. Uh, I'm not sure. I have not read the whole book yet, so I don't know how much, uh, whether or not there's more stuff in here about the Lenape and, uh, you know, the different things that, uh, the crimes that were perpetrated against them. Uh, I do want to say that, you know, in terms of the, the Lenape people, and this still being, you know, in my mind, in my heart, uh, this is this is Algonquin Nation. You know, this is still Algonquin Nation. This is still Lenape land, and the Lenape are not extinct. No, I do not think that I have any Lenape blood. I don't know. Really, I don't know. But I do know people, um, you know, who are black like me, um, who have been, you know, reclassified uh, generations uh, as Negro and not Indian from here. But they know that they are Lenape. So the Lenape are not extinct. Uh, they're not extinct. The the Lenny Lenape, I don't believe that they are extinct either. I think that uh, through the colonization and their, uh, many of them did not go on to reservations. And many of them. Uh, remained uh, participants in the new government that was forming on behalf of, you know, being, representing their people. So, you know, William Penn's uh, relationship with this region, this place, you know, that we are, you hear I'm broadcasting from 19130. This is Philadelphia, Lenape land. Lenny, Lenape land. Um, it has a lot to, you know, we can learn a lot from, from reading and, you know, understanding this stuff. So uh, I'm going to pause right here because I think there was some other things that I wanted to elaborate on and I can't recall them right this second. So just give me a second and I'll be right back. Oh, all right, so I figured it out. Um, so just, just, I just wanted to go back and, um, you know, just, just uh, elaborate a little bit more on the conscience, the liberty of conscience and, you know, how strongly the Quakers really believed in that. And I'm at almost at a half an hour. So I'm going to do this quickly. I'm just going to read this one piece. And I'm going to end this elaboration on this this uh, this one, which is 
part three of episode one. All right. So um, he says, he says, uh, for it were miserable indeed for us to fall under the just censure of the poor Indian conscience while we make professions of profession of things so far transcending. And here it is right here. So far transcending. This is from the book, uh, William Penn's Holy Experiment. This, this particular thing is called Freedom of Religion and Conscience. That no man nor number of men upon earth hath power or authority to rule over men's consciences consciences in religious matters in religious matters therefore it is consented and agreed and ordained that no person or persons whatsoever within the said province at any time or times hereafter shall be any ways upon any pretense whatsoever called in question or in the least punished or hurt either in person, estate, or privilege for the sake of his opinion, judgment, faith, or worship towards God in matters of religion, but that all and every such person and persons may from time to time and at all times freely and fully have and enjoy his and their judgments and the exercise of their consciences, consciences in matters of religious worship throughout all the said province. Okay. So in other words, uh, you know, this is this was the foundation of you know the Quakers' belief uh, and their whole formation of why you know they formed even a a, a whole nother uh, religious sect, if you will. Um, they believed that every man had a right to follow his own conscience in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, religious, spiritual, whatever. And Penn felt that even though the Lenape, the Lenny Lenape were not quote unquote Christians, that their lifestyle, their ancient beliefs, their ancient ways were actually more Christian than what, you know, they were professing to be. And that by even coming and being in a land where they, you know, they came to uh, escape religious persecution and, uh, you know, having to go to jail because they didn't want to swear. Like, you know, when we go to court and they want you to swear on the Bible. Well, they wouldn't do that. And, um, you know, they went to jail. And jail in those times, you know, in those places, it wasn't, it wasn't no joke. They were very serious. So, in my opinion, you know, my opinion about William Penn, I, like, you know, I'm a big fan of William Penn. I think that, you know, if things had went the way that he imagine them and envision them going here you know we wouldn't be in this mess that we're here in now you know in this city philadelphia uh pennsylvania and you know this this is the place of the founding of america so things went really wrong and uh you know We'll learn more about that as I, I'm going to read this book, and I hope it's not too boring, because uh, I really want to read it chapter by chapter without a lot of elaboration. You can, you can go back later 
and elaborate like we're doing now. So, um, that's going to end this episode three. Uh, I'm sorry, part three of episode one, Penelope Reads. This is my podcast. Uh, signing out from the 19130. I hope that uh, it was worth the wait. I apologize for it taking so long. Peace and love, and I'll see you on the next episode, episode two. Peace and love.